you are addressing a room full of crypto and Web3 people. Of course, all different types. We've got VCs, we've got founders, we've got NFT collection people, um, executives from various companies, some Web2 as they're called. We've got folks from Rug Radio, a big NFT live show, folks from Dapper Labs, DraftKings, the sports betting company that now also does NFTs. They really run the gamut, but a lot of true crypto believers, so lots to talk about. And even since we last spoke to you in March, a lot has happened. So let's start with news, news in the crypto world that I want to get your take on. How does that sound? Sure. Uh, since we last spoke to you in March, in late April, a story broke that we covered at Decrypt, and it turned out the story was you helped create Zcash, the privacy coin Zcash. <laughs> and I think for some people that was like, whoa, but also maybe not such a surprise. It fits. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. That happened in 2016, and how did it come about that that news came out now, years later? Uh, yeah, it was uh, a very long time ago. Again, I wasn't a, a central figure in the project. I didn't do any development. I didn't do any coding. Um, it was more that they had, uh, in order to kickstart the Zcash network, uh, which used a novel kind of cryptography that allowed really strong privacy between transactions, uh, that wasn't doing like, you know, shell games, or trying to move things around or just... Uh, use mixing to uh, to the chain, but use zero knowledge proofs. They had to create uh, what was being internally called like a toxic waste key, um, and this was a key that, if anyone had it, could be used to to basically mint new coins on the network uh, and and a bunch of other uh, bad bad things, as I understand it. Um, now, there were a lot of people in like the academic cryptography circles uh, that I followed and I was paying attention to. Um, who were talking about how interesting this project was. And I was aware of it actually from a uh, professor at Johns Hopkins University by the name of Matthew Green, uh, who I, I think uh, tweeted a link to a paper uh, called Zero Cash. This was before it was Zcash. And I just saw the idea of this. And of course, I had been a longtime Bitcoin user. Uh, and I was like, this is amazing. This is incredible. It's something very important that, frankly, should have been integrated into like a, a, the actual Bitcoin network uh, <laughs> through protocol improvements, you know, at this period in time. Um, but they hadn't really taken privacy seriously and unfortunately still don't. Uh, so I was looking at this more like an academic project than, you know, like some kind of uh, everybody makes uh, crypto coins now to try to get like a capital return on it. Uh, but this, they were going, how do we uh, get this key, uh, construct this key, um, that if anybody had it, uh, would be harmful, and how do we make sure nobody does this? So they created this thing called the ceremony, where they would basically do a uh, cryptographic round among many different participants around the world, different people, and the way it was structured was such that if there was one honest person in the entire cohort, um, the dangerous part, uh, the dangerous properties of this key wouldn't exist. And you could uh, basically ensure the network was fully safe and all you needed was one honest person. Um, and you know, one person whose keys weren't stolen, whatever. Uh, everybody else could be against it, could be trying to exploit it, could be doing whatever, and it would work. Uh, and this was something that I got approached by, I, I can't recall actually who approached me, it might have been Zuko. Uh, I believe probably was Zuko, uh, who might have gotten to me because I had uh, written about this paper and my interest in it, um, and said, hey, would you be willing uh, to serve as a part of this ceremony? And I went, well, why not? You know, I, I one person where nobody knows where I am, what I'm doing, whatever. Uh, it would be very hard to target me. Um, I know quite a lot about uh, computer security, uh, but at the same time, I can at least have the honesty layer. Uh, so my uh, sort of vulnerability in this would be hacking, right? It would be surveillance. It would be cameras in the walls from the Russians or whatever, uh, stealing my computer, or using a bad computer, or whatever. Other people might not have a hacking risk. They might have a social risk. They might have an honesty risk, you know, something like that. Uh, but by being a part of this larger cohort, you could make sure uh, that basically nobody uh, cheated the network. And it worked. Right. Uh, since then, there have never been any, as far as anyone's known, knows, uh, sort of greater emissions that should have happened on the network. And eventually, uh, and this is the why it came out later, was uh, 
they moved beyond it. And that key uh, is no longer used. It's no longer sort of a threat to the network. That, that whole um, sort of proving channel is gone and they used a more modern solution that didn't have these same risks. And so they did uh, kind of a little mini documentary talking about this and Zuko reached out to me and was like, would you be willing to uh, sort of say that, you know, you were in this? Because I uh, participated pseudonymously. I didn't want anybody to like use me for a marketing purpose. It was just to contribute. Right. What was uh, your pseudonym? Sort of the improvement, the advancement of this. Uh, and so I said, yeah, sure. I, I was a part of this. I was John Doberton. Right. Uh, I think I was in uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia, according to uh, the legend. Doberton, right. I, I saw some jokes when the news came out that you would help create Zcash of, well, could Snowden have been Satoshi? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I'm not, but I'm very grateful to whoever that was. Uh, you know, I, I have my suspicions. Um, but that's, that's really an incredible story because they gave gift to the whole world uh, and walked off into the sunset one way or another. Right, right. Um, and people are peoples. Um, let, let's stick with privacy and, and Bitcoin's privacy shortcomings, which I think led you to Zcash, as you said. I want to get the quotes right, but you have you know, said this a number of times, written about this. You said, Bitcoin is failing comprehensively, comprehensively on the privacy angle, since, of course, the transactions are not fully anonymous. They're semi-anonymous, which, you know, side note, everyone in this room knows that that's something that a lot of people get wrong. A lot of people who are not in crypto, they say, and it's all anonymous. And when it comes to Bitcoin, it's not. I mean, you can see that, you know, this wallet did the following transaction. You might not see that it was John Miller's wallet, but you see what the wallet has done. Um, I assume that that hasn't really changed. Now, I noticed that just a couple days ago, you retweeted a 2009 tweet from Hal Finney, another person some people think was Satoshi, that said, looking at ways to add more anonymity to Bitcoin. So what would that look like? And what's your updated thinking on how to do crypto with even more privacy? I mean, in Zcash's case, or we could mention Monero, those things still don't really have huge adoption on a, on a mass scale. So where do things stand in terms of improving Bitcoin's privacy value? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the challenge here is everybody knows who, who you know is technically involved in this. Uh, that, that Bitcoin is uh, really bad on privacy. I think the only people who do it worse actually are Ethereum. Um, and that's because they use the account-based model as opposed to the address-based model. Uh, but a lot of people only use like one account. Um, so they see it, it's like as if you were using Bitcoin, you were just reusing the same wallet. Uh, you get this giant history cruft that just follows you wherever. And then you create all these chain explorers. And then, then people see, you know, every smart contract you've interacted with uh, on Ethereum, and it's just it's it's problematic. Uh, Bitcoin suffers from the same thing, but at least uh, largely because there's not as much contract-based activity on uh, Bitcoin. Um, they they only see you know uh, address A sends to address B and so on. They they follow it out. They they chart it. They see where it splits on the chain, and then they try to go uh, where it goes back to a common node, or they track spends, or they go where it goes through KYC gateways, and you know they they find out it. With the tools that I had at the NSA uh, in like 2013, uh, tracking Bitcoin transactions would have been very, very uh, easy. And this is why, even though I used Bitcoin um, to uh, rent the servers that I used for communicating with journalists and passing, you know, massive uh, archive files over the internet anonymously, uh, I was using Tor. I was using uh, sort of mixing services. I was trying to basically do anything that would buy time. It wasn't that I thought the NSA wouldn't be able to follow the trail. Uh, it was that, you know, I'd have to go to this guy and then I'd get routed over to the office and then they wait on it because they had other things to do. Uh, and it wasn't until there would be a sustained effort that they would be able to do this. And by then I would have always already contacted the journalists so the door would be closed. Um, normal Bitcoin users don't have that level of awareness. They don't understand the network flows. They don't understand simply your IP address uh, sending, you know, this... Um, transaction to this node that then passes it on, uh, all of that leaves a history that is largely being recorded. Uh, there are ways on Bitcoin that they can improve this and that are done like coin join transactions and the whole join market thing, uh, which are great, but they're way too technical for average people. We see some wallet providers who are trying to like build in their own mixers and like that, that's great. It's an improvement. 
Um, but it, it's, it's really not enough. You have to have this stuff in the protocol. It has to happen on chain. Uh, and that's where you see things like, yeah, Monero is, is great. I, I use Monero, right? Now, people think I'm like a super Monero hater. And no, it's, they've got a couple super toxic people in their community. Uh, and there were some bad design decisions like a million years ago. Uh, and it's not perfect, right? But, but what is? Uh, Zcash has its own flaws, too. Um, and then Zcash, you know, it's also great, but, you know, for a lot of people, they're not using uh, the shield of transactions, or at least they weren't using the shield of transactions. Now it's getting easier. They've got uh, mobile clients that will actually, you'll do a transparent transaction, and then it'll roll you over to a shielded transaction automatically. And these things are great. This is what we need, though. We need people to be able to transact on-chain at any time and effortlessly without their awareness, the same way that when you connect to, you know, Gmail through a web browser, uh, it's using HTTPS, um, you should have uh, levels of privacy protection baked into the protocol. Uh, and this prevents the kind of tomfoolery uh, that we see the U.S. government beginning to engage in uh, with, with things like OFAC and Tornado Cash. I was just about to segue to Tornado Cash. Uh, I made a perfect news event to, to ask you about. I think for a lot of people, you know, even inside crypto, it was a wake-up call because the appeal for a lot of crypto OGs who've been in it since 2009, or if it's the Ethereum people, it's, you know, 2015, is not that it's completely untouchable, but, you know, unstoppable. Uh, anyone in government is, oh, shut it down. Well, they can't shut it down. That's the whole appeal. And yet, well, they can tell centralized actors not to allow customers who've wall whose wallets have interacted with this coin mixer. Um, other than, you know, basically proving many of your points, what's your latest thinking on the sanctioning of Tornado Cash and, and what people who believe in crypto should make of this and, and how concerned they should be about kind of this regulatory moment coming? Yeah, I, I think members of the public, certainly, they, they don't even know that this happened. Um, but members of the crypto community largely uh, aren't taking this seriously enough. This is absolutely a do or die moment um, for the relationship between the network and the state. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. But I, I, it's there is a there is a level of technical innocence or less charitably ignorance uh, that people need to understand the average person has, right? Um, what is happening now is what happened and destroyed the spirit of the original web. Uh, I think a lot of people who are in this room, um, they've been technical for a very long time. They've been a part of the internet for a very long time. They've seen it change. Uh, a lot of you in the room remember what dial-up modems uh, sound like, right? Um, that's not actually shared by the vast majority of the population, even people who are of the right age. Uh, and, and we lost that internet because we onboarded billions of people um, and the people who were providing the gateways for that didn't have their best interests at heart, right? Um, that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing people exploiting the kind of ignorance that made so many people now think tapping like the Facebook app on your phone, that's the internet as they understand it. Um, and now think, you know, crypto is Coinbase, right? Uh, or, 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 or something else <laughs> equally horrible um, as that. And to you, those of you in the room who are, you know, work for Coinbase, uh, it, it's really nothing personal. You're just an example of uh, the sort of overly compliant, overly indulgent uh, sort of thinking, which, yeah, you guys still get rich, you'll make a lot of money, uh, but have you actually uh, sort of advanced the interests of society? I, you know, maybe in the same way that people sell lawnmowers do. Uh, <laughs> you're not even building lawnmowers, you're selling them. But great, you've popularized the lawnmower. Um, lawnmowers are important, they're valuable, right? Uh, but when I go and buy a lawnmower, uh, nobody asks for me to hold up my passport and scan my face. Uh, and the fact that you guys go along with that is frankly toxic and embarrassing. Uh, you're, you're, getting, uh, you're getting some applause in the room. I mean, and I would just sort of ha 
half interrupt to say that this topic keeps coming up at this conference because in some ways I think people in crypto are concerned that it will be the centralized actors who play nice with regulators, who do KYC, who say, show your passport to buy the lawnmower, that will eventually succeed. I mean, a big conversation yesterday was Apple saying we're going to take our usual app store cut of apps that have NFTs, right? So I guess, you know, what are crypto people to do to not end up just losing to the same old incumbent tech powers that are publicly traded and, and warm up to regulators and, and follow all the rules? Uh, the real answer is you make the protocol do the work. Um, you can't trust people, uh, but you can trust code, uh, or at least you can trust code more. Um, let, let me get back on the, the tornado cash thing, because that's uh, sort of where all of this gets complex and interesting. Um, what you just said, where, uh, uh, like, the big players will become the sizable entities in the field. Uh, we know that works. That's simply uh, sort of efficiencies of scale. It's going to happen here. Uh, my plea to those of you who are in that uh, sort of big end of the pool is if you're going to cave, um, cave strategically. Uh, leave space uh, for the protocol and for the sort of values that we're all supposed to be representing here. Um, to make sure that, yeah, the government wants to do something and they can layer some law on you because you're big and you've got 10 million employees and they can all come and arrest you. Um, but make sure that, yeah, if you are a stub uh, and you have to check passports and you have to identify wallets to go, you know, one hop out, um, you understand and you structure your systems in such a way and everyone understands uh, that that's fine but as soon as somebody goes one more hop out to the second hop they move to the other wallet uh, your trail goes cold and when it comes back into your exchange uh, you have to ask people uh, what their purposes are they declare this whatever um, but you really have no way of checking it uh, and you don't want to be in a position where you can check that uh, because really, that's not your role in society, even the government says it is. Uh, that's for police. That's for intelligence, right? Uh, that's their job. And their job is supposed to be hard. Don't make their lives easier, right? Uh, uh, there's this whole mindset in government and this argument for everybody who's been following cryptography, we know about like going dark. They're like, oh, we want to peel back WhatsApp's encryption. We want to make sure that Apple... Uh, doesn't turn on end-to-end -end encryption. We want to make sure they push all their crap uh, to the iCloud in unencrypted backups or backups to which Apple has the keys that police can request them or you know, weak keys that police can track them. Um, and every time Apple gets close to doing that, uh, they go and complain and they go, well, we're going to cause problems. We're going to pass a law if you do this. So Apple caves, so they re-engineer things to make it uh, sort of problematic again. Uh, understand the difference between their job and their role in society and your job. The job of policing is supposed to be hard because if it's not, we live in a police state. Uh, we don't want everything we do to be scrutinized. We don't want every transaction to be monitored. We don't want to show our passports to uh, do lawnmowers. And the government has more power and more capability now than they ever have at any point in history. Do not be charitable. Do not be generous to them. Uh, they don't need more help. They don't need more tools. They don't need more weapons. They have enough, and they're reorganizing society to itself be a weapon. Uh, which brings us back to Tornado Cash. There are actually, I would like to believe, well-intentioned people in this space. Uh, Bruce Schneier, uh, for example, a great academic cryptographer. Uh, I read his book, Practical Cryptography, or actually Applied Cryptography. Um, sort of pre-NSA everything. Uh, I liked it. It influenced me. It, it taught me a lot. Uh, and I've lectured at his Harvard course for, I don't know, five years, something like that. Uh, but he's writing in, in Lawfare, which is a deeply authoritarian, terrible pro-government uh, sort of structure for influencing Congress to become worse, uh, that Tornado Cash was like a golem. And they wrote this very uh, sort of emotionally provocative piece uh, where he's applying his cryptographic knowledge to make an argument that this is something new and terrible. It's an autonomous entity like the golem from sort of uh, uh, Jewish mythology. I think Peter Van Valkenburg just wrote a piece on this uh, sort of arguing against it that I thought was great. Uh, and it's autonomous. Somebody 
sort of constructs it and it's out there and it's evil and it's destroying uh, sort of everything and doing bad deeds until it stopped. And thank God for the wonderful wholesomeness of government, which came forth and like stilled the golem uh, with its magical power of sanctions and save the day. But it, it shows that even good people can be emotionally persuaded by the newness, the novelty, and the power, the promise uh, of these new networks to become, frankly, authoritarian traditionalists, a kind of conservative who goes, we've gone far enough with progress, we should stop, let's relax. Uh, and, and again, this isn't to bag on Bruce, he's just representative uh, of other people in the sector. I respect uh, Bruce tremendously. But uh, this whole analogy that this smart contract is like this marauding beast and it's acting on its own, um, is completely wrong. Uh, Tornado Cash is, was, will be simply a tool. It does nothing without human provocation, right? It's, it's like a, sort of a wrench sitting on the shelf. You have to pick it up and use it for it to do anything. Um, and I think a more honest analogy here would be that Tornado Cash is a water fountain, but you push the button and privacy comes out. It doesn't do anything unless you push it, but it, it's, it's a very simple thing. Uh, and the suggestion that this is a bad thing, much less the kind of thing that uh, sort of merits granting the government a new and largely unlimited sanctions authority, uh, to say nothing of kicking in the door and like imprisoning the poor bastard who was decent enough to build this in the park in the first place for us to benefit from, uh, that is something that is deeply liberal and profoundly authoritarian. Uh, we should resist that suggestion. Uh, <laughs> And in my opinion, uh, we should simply gift the city a, a new water fountain, sneak into the park uh, at night, <laughs> wear a mask, wear gloves if you must, uh, but make sure that if people are thirsty, they can find something to drink because the human right to privacy is non-negotiable. It, it's a great answer. And, you know, between the water fountain analogy and the lawnmower analogy, um, th those will be the favorites this year compared to when you spoke in Jackson in March we asked you about CBDCs, and it, it really stuck with me. You said that it reminds you of uh, Scrooge McDuck using his giant vacuum to reach down and, and suck people's coins from their pockets. Um, I, I can't imagine that your thinking on CBDCs, and for anyone who doesn't know, we're talking about central bank digital currencies, has changed. Um, you, you wrote in your, on your blog a year ago that they will ransom our future. But what has changed is, uh, or maybe continued apace, is that certain governments seem intent on doing them. You know, whether, whether people in crypto say, you know, that's not a true cryptocurrency anyway, or what's the point? Uh, I don't know who's out there clamoring for, for a Fed coin in the US, but China did it, you know, there's a digital yuan, launched it, it it's in people's wallets. Um, certain officials in the US continue to say that we're looking into it, we're looking into it. It seems like it, it, it's, you know, on the way. What do you make of their intent on doing this? What would be the purpose? And if you're someone who is against this, I mean, other than I guess you don't use it, but that's something that would have immediate, probably big adoption because it's basically a government-backed, you know, digital coin. Where do you think things stand on the CBDC front? Yeah, I mean, I, I think people um, in the U.S. Actually, this is where we give the Coinbase-type people uh, sort of props. Uh, the ones who have been pouring money into lobbying in Congress uh, have actually won some proponents here who say, don't, don't do this, it's not good for the United States. We've seen uh, Fed governors, uh, Waller, I think, um, say they're not interested in it, it's not good, it's not useful. Um, some some other ones as well, uh, and this is very promising, right? But because we don't need we don't need it. It doesn't uh, it, it, <laughs> it causes problems, but it doesn't solve any problems. Uh, it leaves people from the the tribe that believe human privacy is a human right, uh, and believe sound money uh, is a desirable property. Um, because yeah, once uh, government can reach every unit of currency in every place, uh, rather than it being a pocket, in a pocket or hidden under a mattress where they can't reach it. Um, it's better that we make sure there are some limits on their capability, make sure there are some limits on their reach. Uh, but in, in terms of where that goes, what that does, um, and, and how we respond to it, I, I think the core point is to ensure 
any place that we see these, they should be convertible, right? Uh, the interesting thing about China's uh, version of this is that they have a largely closed economy, right? Uh, there's investment and cross-listing, uh, but you, you can't freely convert uh, the Chinese yen uh, to like the U.S. dollar and back and forth uh, without a lot of red tape. Um, and so that makes it easier for them to do this. They are hyper-authoritarian to the point of being increasingly totalitarian. Uh, people aren't using physical cash as much. They're using their social media uh, sort of ID to have their own wallet and do all of uh, their transactions. It's in every store. They're being photographed as they come and go. Like, it's a, a privacy nightmare. The thing is, if you move to one step out, right, uh, for example, the Russian economy, um, cryptocurrency for payments, uh, are forbidden, at least domestically. Uh, internationally, they talk about beginning to legalize it because of obviously sanctions and everything like that. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's not really clear. There's a lot of sophisticated and deep thinking happening in the Russian government, which is probably not surprising to a lot of people uh, on, on this topic. Uh, but there is kind of like a, a, a gray market thing here where Russia has like 50 different PayPal equivalents, right? Um, and there are third-party services that will take your, you know, Bitcoin or your Monero or whatever, and then they'll send the money that they change from that into your wallet for this. Uh, and then you can change that uh, back and forth. So you could take money, uh, send it to a third-party gray market kind of middleman, turn that into U.S. dollar coin or Tether or, or whatever. Um, and... Uh, basically you can move in and out of the economy that way you can make uh, payments more privately in a weird way in Russia uh, than you could in a lot of places because of that gray market space now obviously as things get more complex as they get more regulated like we're gonna see that change and adapt and evolve um, but I think we're gonna see a schism here where we see governments develop in one of two directions uh, they are going to be either in this very Russian pioneering sense, um, and I'm not trying to impose a value judgment there. I'm just saying it's, it's very uh, wild and frontiersy there. Uh, there's a lot of freelancing, and the law is uh, less clear, so you see a lot of experimentation. And then the China direction, um, where everything is gated, everything is watched, everything is permissioned. Mm. Um, and what I, I want to sort of put people on watch for is uh, when we get back to Ethereum again uh, and this whole OFAC thing, uh, the idea of OFAC compliance being desirable or being something that you want to do. Like if you're Coinbase and you're just passing things in and out, uh, that's one thing. If you're Coinbase and you're running validators, that's a very different, very dangerous thing. You guys shouldn't be running validators uh, because you can't defend the values that you should be promoting to your customers uh, by doing so. And a lot of people aren't going to like that because they're like, well, we've got 10 trillion, you know, Ethereum uh, in deposits. Well, you got to loan that out to somebody who can actually do something good for the world with it, as opposed to doing it for yourself under these regulations where you're, you're doing a sort of blacklisting on it. Um, what I'm talking about, for those of you who are less familiar, is the censorship problem on the Ethereum blockchain right now. Uh, since they moved from proof of work to proof of stake, uh, I, I wrote about this actually many years ago, but I kind of got it wrong. I said proof of work basically creates a lot of problems in one direction, waste of energy, uh, e-waste, and things like that. Sure, we understand it. Uh, we're running a giant math contest, and the only prize is the next block, uh, the block reward from that. But on the other hand, when you move to proof of stake, you bypass all of that wasted effort, um, but you have then entrenched a system in which the rich get richer. Uh, so, like, which of these is more desirable? Well, then when we go, the people who are rich have much more to lose uh, from breaking the rules. You, you see that you actually you start to create an inevitably more centralized network over time. And this is a big problem. Now, this is a major experiment. It's very interesting. I, I think the proof of stake uh, thing on Ethereum is great, and it's something we want to see succeed. Uh, but this centralization thing we haven't dealt with, and uh, OFAC has really pounced on this. Earlier today, uh, I checked um, 
MEV Watch, uh, if you look it up, it's a site that goes how many blocks of uh, last day or week or month or whatever are censored on the Ethereum network. Today, it was 53%. Uh, and I read a headline for somebody that says that spiked as high as 63%. Uh, think about that. If two-thirds of a blockchain's transactions uh, are censored, that's a fail state. Uh, at, at that point, you might as well be using PayPal. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that because I hate PayPal, uh, and I love Ethereum. Um, but everyone involved in the Ethereum ecosystem needs to understand that this is an existential threat to the project. This is what I mean by do-or-die moment. Mm. Uh, if 2% of transactions are censored, like, okay, sure, you just wait for the next block. But if one idiot uh, sitting behind a desk in Washington uh, can stamp a piece of paper without so much as passing a law, uh, and in a few months, every other block in your network, or two out of three on your network, and it's still creeping up, so it's going to be eight out of ten, you know, uh, every block in your network is getting stopped and frisked. You're the opposite of decentralized. Uh, and if you think that this thing with Tornado Cash is the last paper that somebody in Washington is going to stamp, uh, you're going to have a very bad time over the next decade. Uh, so I, I think the right move here is for people involved in these kind of projects, for people running validators, for people uh, working on protocols, for people uh, working in the KYC gateways, uh, is to say, look, if Washington wants to tr censor transactions, you are more than welcome to on your own validators. You can buy your own ETH, you can stake it on your own nodes, uh, and you can censor to your little heart's delight, uh, but you are not the king of the internet. Uh, and I would argue that, quite frankly, they're beginning to look more like the enemy of it, uh, and Ethereum shouldn't be a part of that. Getting a, a couple more snaps in the room for that. I've got uh, two more for you, and then some of our audience members are very excited to get to ask you a question. Um, I, I want to ask sure. you, Ed, about your bags, as they say in the crypto world. People ask about what's in your bags. Um, you told the author of the book, Dark Mirror, that after you um, did your leaking in 2013, your supporters sent you enough Bitcoin to live on until the fucking sun dies. So in that time, Bitcoin is up nearly 30x since then. And of course, everyone points to how much it's down in the last year. But it's up 30x since you were donated all that Bitcoin. So, you know, unless you, you sold all of it, um, I guess I'm asking, are you Bitcoin rich these days? And I think I read recently that you're working, doing IT for a company there in Russia. Is that the case? And why do you need to work? <laughs> Uh, so one thing I would say, uh, don't trust everything that you read in the press. Uh, secondly, that was written by Barton Gelman. I, I like Barton Gelman. He's a good journalist. Uh, he's uh, nobody's friend, right? Uh, but that's an uh, important quality for some of the best journalists. Um, that was a, a private comment that wasn't meant uh, to be published. Uh, but look, my advice is, as a privacy advocate, if anybody asks you what uh, crypto you have, what do you hold, the answer is, what is crypto? Um, <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, but I'm not at risk of uh, going hungry, uh, certainly not this year, let's put it that way. Okay. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we've got a lot of, so you won't tell us what other crypto besides Bitcoin you own. <laughs> just just <laughs> no, to be clear. Of <laughs> I wanted to make sure I ask. Um, uh, we've got a lot of NFT people in the room. What is your take on NFTs? Uh, in my experience with NFTs is <laughs> basically nothing but positive uh, because I, I use them for fundraising for a non-government uh, organization, Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, and uh, we put together an NFT um, called Stay Free, uh, which was basically a portrait for me by a great photographer, Platon, uh, who gave us uh, the sort of permission to, to use it for this. Uh, and then we overlaid it with the, um, uh, forgive me, it's late here, the uh, court papers, right, uh, for the decision that actually said what the NSA was doing is illegal. Um, and, you know, it, it was just a... A small thing, I, I was talking uh, to Trevor Tim, the executive director of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, and I was like, you know, if we make a couple thousand dollars off of this, great, you know. Uh, it was like $5 million uh, that somebody donated uh, to, to win that. 
Uh, and it's just, it's tremendous. Like that was, that funded years of operation for an NGO uh, from one auction. Um, when you see people that are, you know, doing all these PFP NFTs and whatever, it's like whatever floats your boat, guys. Um, I, I think NFTs, the idea of it, the property of it, which is that we are just tokenizing things on the blockchain uh, that people can show a property interest in, a possessory interest in. Uh, you can demonstrate, you know, control of this key effectively. Uh, but these keys are different and they're transient and this sort of people are passing them around uh, in a way that's a little bit different than what we think of as, as sort of a more fungible, even though it's not fungible, like Bitcoin type thing. Uh, you, you need to have a more uh, history-less chain for it to be truly fungible. Um, there, there's just a lot of interesting potential there. Now, do we see it developing there sort of broadly in a way that's uh, getting a lot of embrace and use? I haven't seen it personally. Uh, there's all these uh, sort of earn to play uh, gaming things. I think they've been uh, not very successful in terms of games because they're mostly, uh, I, I think, uh, designed to extract value from VCs right now. Um, but when we earlier uh, today, I was tweeting about uh, sort of Mark Zuckerberg and his stock is, you know, down in the pits. Uh, he's betting a lot on this meta thing and everybody's like, oh, Facebook is finished. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, uh, Facebook is, is probably finished. Sure. Uh, it's on the decline. Um, but this meta thing, it's a long shot, but you put enough talented people in a room, you look at these things, and then you create the demand yourself uh, because you already control things like Instagram and WhatsApp, and you can buy whatever else uh, that's the next hot new thing. Um, you can push people into that, and then he owns your eyeballs uh, and can rent them out and you know run ads every time you blink. When we look at the fact that Frankly, the world is heading in the wrong direction. Uh, we're in a dark place. Uh, everybody's, you know, in uh, the official uh, circles are going, oh, it's fine, we're gonna bounce back. At the same time, they keep issuing more sanctions. They keep wrecking the global economy. They're cutting economic ties. They're increasing militarism. Um, and everybody's talking about civilizational conflict. Uh, what is the cost of that? Uh, what's the world going to look like uh, when you're spending the money that you should be spending on, you know, education, health, and all of these things uh, on bombs and guns and tanks, right? Uh, whether it's Russia doing it, whether it's China doing it, whether it's the United States doing it, uh, that's a problem. That sucks. We don't want to see that. But we're seeing more and more of it. And so young people who have fewer opportunities, houses cost, you know, $10 trillion. Uh, now, you know, they'll have a... a um, Correction, but okay, great. Now they cost $8 trillion. Uh, the jobs that are out there aren't uh, sort of what they want. There's not a lot of promise there. There's not a lot of ladder there. Uh, people are going to retreat. We already see it. Like the whole COVID era of isolation, uh, that leaves marks. That leaves scars. Uh, people have gone into the digital world more and more. Uh, I think a lot of depression uh, has arisen as a uh, result. But people are going to work to try to make the digital world more and more enticing, more and more attractive, because people will need to spend more time there as they have uh, less economic power to spend and engage in the real world. Uh, that's super dark, and it's not guaranteed but with the policies that we see being advocated and pursued right now, that's where we're headed, right? Uh, and I think if people are spending more time online, uh, we are going to see people holding more of their property online. Uh, I'm not saying it's the majority. I'm not saying it's most, right? Uh, but you don't even need that um, to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. Like, it, it's very difficult to look at that. But NFTs right now are, you know, you, you guys know better than anyone. Um, they are still very much a novelty. Uh, and where they go from here uh, is very difficult to predict. Yep. Um, 
We got, I got one more for you myself, and then if, if anyone in the room wants to ask their question, I think best thing would be head over here to the, to the side, and we'll do a couple sitting here. Courtney can grab you. But Ed, uh, one more personal one from us here, here in the room. A lot of DAO folks at this event, a lot of people who are representing DAOs, they believe in the future of DAOs, they think those are going to be really interesting. Even at Decrypt, you know, we've helped set up a publisher's DAO. It's called PubDAO, and the idea is to have multiple different publishers in it. We've discussed the idea of using it as a tipster line. You know, what if someone could submit a tip, then you've got checkers who verify and fact check the tip. The checkers submit it to publishers, and publishers publish stories based on the tips. Um, you know, when you get into something like rewarding people for that, paying, whether it's in tokens or, or any other currency, does that create an issue with the veracity of the tips? What's your take on this? And I mean, if something like this had been set up when you did your leaking 10 years ago, do you think that would have changed things, improved the process, allowed you more anonymity if there was sort of a crypto-based um, tip line for whistleblowers? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, for me personally, because uh, you know, I, I understood enough about how all the technology works that I effectively made my own, right? Uh, I found the journalist that it was quite difficult. Uh, you know, I got rejected a lot uh, in the beginning, but you know, you persist, you find uh, sort of ways to move laterally and then you get in. Um, and then when you've talked to one, you can talk to the others through them. And then everybody's on a team. You, you create that internal competition. So you're not dependent on uh, sort of one journalist getting everything right or making a mistake, but instead you have them compete against uh, each other to keep everyone honest, uh, and then whatever. Uh, we actually have this now um, with SecureDrop. It's the marquee project for the, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, which is basically everything you said minus the tokenization reward. And basically every major newsroom in the world is using this now. It's not very well known. Uh, because it's not uh, super hugely advertised. Uh, but if you want to get a tip digitally to uh, the New York Times, right, uh, or the Washington Post, they've got a secure drop link uh, on their site. You can go to it through Tails. Uh, it connects through Tor. Um, you send an encrypted email uh, effectively. It's not uh, an email, but directly to them on a private site that they control. It's got uh, sort of air-gapping different systems on it in their newsroom. They've got a couple employees uh, that are trained on the system that go through and just see uh, which, um, which of these sort of submissions is credible, is legitimate, is authentic, and which ones are about you know, how aliens mm -hmm. built the pyramids. Um, and there's a, a lot of both, but actually some of the biggest stories uh, of the Trump era, as I understand it, uh, actually came through SecureDrop. Uh, and that, that's a, a remarkable thing, right? But the, the, the sort of what's new on what you talked about was this reward aspect. Right. Well, we do see uh, reward schemes used for whistleblowing in the financial context, right? Uh, sort of reporting the government waste, fraud, and abuse. Yeah. Uh, we're cheating on taxes. Uh, we've seen it done in, like, Switzerland. Um, yeah, we see it done in the United States. And, like, this actually has prompted uh, positive results in some cases. The idea of sort of a communal uh, pot for rewarding stories of a certain type, I haven't seen before. Uh, it actually reminds me of the old paper, uh, I think it was Assassination Politics, about assass an assassination market where it's people uh, are basically putting bounties on public figures. Uh, and I think it would get tremendous uh, sort of pushback as a kind of vigilantism. Um, the question is, do you want your sources to be motivated by money? Uh, and how much no. money does it take to do that? <laughs> yeah. uh, if you're reporting on Goldman Sachs, right, uh, and you can get you know some uh, percentage of the fine that they pay, that's a ridiculous amount of money, right? Uh, if it's something else, it's, I don't know. It, it, it's interesting, I think, but difficult uh, ethically, uh, sort of implementing it would not be hard, uh, but it, it's very much an experimental thing. I, I just haven't heard of it uh, before. It is an interesting uh, idea, let's put it that way. Maybe we'll consult with you further on it. Um, we've got just a, a few more questions for you here, and I want to thank you again for, for being willing to take some questions from the audience. So thank you, Ed. And sure, of course. We have our first questioner here. 
Hi there, Mr. Snowden. Um, yeah, thanks again for spending some time with us today. Um, my name's Chase, and the question I wanted to ask you about is um, on the, the topic of the network state. Uh, just for the audience, some background. Um, the idea of the network state was put forward by uh, Balaji Srinivasan earlier this summer. Um, in a single sentence, he describes a network state as a highly aligned um, community with a collective or capacity for collective action that crowdfund, crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. Um, I would be curious just to hear your opinions on the topic and whether you think this is a viable future path for us um, as an alternative to the nation state government model. Um, and I work at Masari. Yeah, it's, it, it's a really interesting, thanks for the question. Uh, Balaji, I, I haven't been able to read all his stuff. Um, but uh, he's a very interesting thinker in the space. Uh, I think we, it is correct to see there are people who owe a uh, higher loyalty, you might say, um, to the network uh, than to their local government. And as the values that are represented by spaces on the internet increasingly diverge, uh, from the populist and majoritarian impulses of an increasingly conflict-wracked world, uh, we're probably going to see more of that. And the question is, how does that manifest itself? How is it channeled? Uh, is it constructive? Is it destructive? Um, and frankly, we all get a vote in that based on how we contribute to it or how we interact with it or refuse to interact with it. Um, I have... <laughs> previously uh, advocated for something similar to that in the context of, uh, again, the woes of the over-centralized sort of KYC squatters in the, in the crypto space. Um, and this is uh, this idea that I have of like the first post-national bank. Uh, all of these banks are like, yeah, we're regulated by wherever we have our office. Well, don't have an office. Uh, all of our employers or whatever, uh, all of our employees can be targeted. Why does anybody know who your employees are? Um, and this is, <laughs> this is going to change over time. Uh, right now, it's still very difficult. It, it's difficult to interact. It's difficult to work. It's difficult to participate. Uh, again, the tooling um, and the likelihood that people slip up, they expose their identities, uh, they talk, uh, place them all at risk. But as you get this network state model, uh, where, I don't know, people live and they go to the Maldives or something like that, uh, where there's not quite so much involvement. And maybe they move into places that, that frankly, aren't going to cooperate uh, with the likely candidates for interference um, in these kind of post-national organizations. Uh, you'll see a new relationship uh, between the state and the network. And that's really what we've been waiting to emerge since John Perry Barlow wrote the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace uh, back in the 90s. Uh, John Perry Barlow was on the board at the Freedom of the Press Foundation. He's a friend of mine, a remarkable individual. Uh, and it's a shame that he's not with us now, but that those ideas, that writing is still there. A lot of us have forgotten about it. And, you know, you look at it now and it's like, oh, it's so naive. Uh, the idea that we can address governments is, oh, you weary giants of flesh and steel, uh, you hold no power here in the, the, the new domain of the mind, right? Um, but what if he was just even earlier than we thought? Uh, and, and maybe we are still in the dark valley on our way to the promised land, right? Uh, and I, I think when you look at all of that and you look at the problems, you look at the struggles, uh, you see the road ahead. We know there are wolves out in there in the forest, um, but we can prepare for them, right? We're not going to win in a stroke. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing battle. And the people who have a stake in making sure the world stays the same rather than progressing are going to fight us. But just because they have more power right, in the moment does not guarantee that they're likely to win. Uh, and I, I think what we're seeing, part of the reason we see so much conflict arising around the world today, is there is an erosion of state power. Uh, they are increasingly equal to one another. And while their powers are sort of magnifying relative to the individual, um, the influence that an individual can have, can, can wield in society, a private individual, uh, is increasing to become a real 
subject of concern for the nation state. A great example here is Elon Musk, right? Uh, they are freaking out about him uh, buying Starlink, or not buying Starlink, uh, buying Twitter. Uh, they are freaking out about the way he operates Starlink. Uh, you know, you have heads of state uh, who are basically lobbying this guy, trying to get him to act this way or that. That's a remarkable a level of influence for somebody to have in a society. And a lot of people are threatened by this, and I'm not saying it's something that we want, but we need to be aware of it, and we need to think about how that affects the dynamics of what the world is going to look like tomorrow. So to go back to the network state and, you know, what do I think about it? Um, I think we haven't really even seen the beginning of it yet. Um, but 10 years on, uh, the world is going to be very different. And we need to make sure that we have a hand in determining how that looks. Awesome. Appreciate it. Just a couple more. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Elon Musk and Twitter. It was on my list to ask you about. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, uh, Edward Snowden, for joining us. My name is Cass Vegas. I am the founder of NFT INT and head of community for Feature.io. My question is, we all know this trilemma that we're going through of scalability and security. It's a broad, complex answer, but what are some actionable steps to the security and privacy side of Web3 and blockchain tech? Uh, I mean, this is this is too big for me to answer, particularly in limited time as we get to the end of the session. It's, frankly, I'm not really qualified uh, to answer it. I can share my thoughts, right? Uh, but I'm I'm not Mr. Wizard. Uh, there are a lot of people in the room who have much uh, greater credibility uh, and sort of established experience who can probably give you a better answer. But my my reflex here is that everybody gets excited about sort of speed and scalability. Um, and what is so remarkable uh, about how Bitcoin succeeded in the way, the, the reason uh, that it changed the world is because that wasn't really the focus. Uh, it was a factor. It was an interest. But they went, let's make this work. Uh, let's make it powerful. Let's make it uh, unstoppable. Um, and then we can worry about uh, sort of the scaling and the speed and everything else later. Um, now... Satoshi wasn't trying to uh, attract VC capital, right? Um, he wasn't worried about, uh, or she wasn't worried about um, the competition. Uh, but when we look at it today, we have these networks and we see things like, uh, again, the privacy coins are a great example of this. Uh, they are really strictly better um, than uh non-private competitors in a lot of ways, but the network effect determines so much in terms of use, in terms of adoption, in terms of acceptance, uh, that it's really difficult for them to get traction. Uh, one of the things that is very, so interesting to me about Ethereum um, is the fact that it has so much interaction, it has so many cross-chain uh, activity through bridges and whatever. Um, Bitcoin, we really don't have very much uh, with that, except as the clues to sort of enable everything else, uh, because it wasn't really supportive of the protocol layer. Um, we see more interest in it, but I, I think the idea that we need to accept, uh, and un unfortunately, Ethereum is really calling this into jeopardy with this whole OFAC thing, because it, it shows... Uh, the flaw of going, well, let's focus on speed, scalability, efficiency, and let's put sort of decentralization to the wayside. Um, we need movement between chains, right? There's, there's like the Bitcoin maximalist mindset where it's like one coin to rule them all. Uh, and we're going to end up there if the other chains, frankly, don't get their shit together, like with Ethereum. Uh, but that's not the world we want. We want, we want people to be able to choose the properties that are most efficient and interesting and valuable to them. Maybe you store uh, your savings in a coin that's a strictly good store of value, right? And I'm talking about uh, like Tether or stable coins. Uh, I, I think the centralized stable coins are crap. Uh, I'm very interested in like the, the MakerDAO DAI thing, not the Maker token, but the DAI part of it. Uh, it's phenomenal. The fact that it still works uh, is remarkable. The fact that it still holds its peg is remarkable uh, just so, through some over collateralized uh, algorithm schemes. Uh, but then when you want to uh, sort of make it more private, 
you move it through, whether it's a tornado cache like thing that's on chain, great if that's supported there. But imagine it's able to freely move to another chain. Uh, we see something now like the Ren bridge that allows you to move from Ethereum into like Renzec, uh, and then you've got your Zcash there. And then maybe later on you move back into Bitcoin because you want to spend there or speculate or, or whatever. You just trust this one more uh, to hold its value. Or there's some feature of the chain there that's interesting to you. And then you move it somewhere else. There should be a portability here that's not costing you like 2% on every transaction where you know we have all these DeFi people uh, that are just trying to is extract rents from the, the ecosystem. Uh, but we want people to be able to answer that trilemma for themselves. Uh, right now, very few people are qualified to do that because they don't understand the implications of moving between these chains. They don't understand the values and the properties between it. They just see a stupid dog avatar and a coin that comes out of Elon Musk's account. And then they're like, yeah, write me down for that one. Um, and that's a problem. But as the space matures, as P these, uh, sort of networks become more sophisticated, people should be trusted to make their own decisions on these kind of things. Uh, and we should enable that. There should be coins that are better in certain parts of this uh, trilemma than others. And that's okay, right? Maybe we have a transactional layer where it's super fast uh, and it's got great scale, but it's got terrible properties for everything else. It's super centralized. But it doesn't really matter because you never keep anything on that chain. You only basically uh, rinse through it to uh, spend. Uh, it could happen transparently. Nobody's even aware it's there. But the infrastructure has to exist. People have to build it. Like there has to be space. Uh, and that that's where we still see the great immaturity of the space. Everything is an experiment. Uh, and the people who are doing really well with precisely this kind of thing like the Ethereum guys, uh, I, I really like, again, that they've done this proof of stake thing, uh, but it's incomplete. We don't have the end. Now we're being confronted with the problems of it, and they really need an answer for this. And right now, there's been no response uh, to the OFAC compliant uh, um, compliance disease that's you know, eating into their blocks, uh, and we needed a solution to that. Thank you. Really good. Uh, the people in the room are, are really interested in all this. We appreciate your time, Ed, and it's been a little bit of a marathon here. C can you take one more question? Sure. Okay. Um, hello, Mr. Snowden. Um, I, I just want to say that, you know, they, 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 lots of people may look at you like a criminal, but I look at you truly as a hero. Um, what my question to you uh, is, oh, my name is, my name is Israel. Uh, I'm a crypto native person. I believed in Bitcoin before it ever had a price just because I want to replace the medium of exchange between human beings to something that's actually valuable. And so, um, so, so, the, so the reality, so, I, so I, I would like to ask you this question. So you did what you, so you, 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 pull, you did the whistleblower thing. Uh, you provided the world with all this information on how its privacy was being invaded and how and 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 but instead of uh, citizens uh, being outraged, uh, they you know they the world prosecuted you, and now you're in another place. And I don't think the world has changed that much. I think people have become more accepting of authority um, that that controls their privacy and the way in which they live, the way in which they transact. And so my my question to you is, how does that make you feel? How does it make you feel? that you sacrificed so much and that you took, put, your, put your life and well-being at great risk, and yet society seemingly continues to move in this direction. And also, though a uh, wise man once told me control is an illusion, um, a lot of people don't believe so. Do you see a hope? Well, let me, let me actually turn that back around for you just uh, quickly. Have you ever been disappointed by people, right? <laughs> people in your life, people collectively. I mean, look at the world right now. Uh, people are disappointing frequently, often, maybe usually. But when you broaden out the spectrum, um, people do amazing things in time. Uh, often we have to give people a lot of chances to get things right. And they're going to let us down. They're going to fail uh, again and again and again. I didn't come forward to tell people what to do. 
Uh, I'm not the president of the internet. I'm not the king of secrets. I wasn't trying to say, you know, here's what you need to know. Uh, here's what you should do. Here's how the law should change. I intentionally structured the system that I set up with journalists so that I couldn't tell them what to publish and what not to publish. I could have, you know, been trying to hand out documents one at a time, say, write this, write this, and you'll get another one. And so I gave them the archive and I said, uh, you guys are getting this on the condition that you don't publish any story that you're not willing to make a personal judgment and organizational institutional judgment on the part of the newspapers that is in the public interest to know. Don't publish a story just because, uh, you know, it's newsworthy. It'll get a headline. It'll get clicks. Publish what people need to know. And I want you to take my bias out of it because I have extremely strong political feelings about this. Uh, and I don't want to go too far, make a risk, make a mistake on my own. So you guys are going to check me. You're going to check each other. Uh, and we're going to reconstruct the system of checks and balances uh, that had failed in our government and try to uh, recreate the institutional sense that we lost through private uh, civil uh, means. And that kind of cooperation worked. Everyone in the world uh, learned that mass surveillance has arrived. It's not a conspiracy. It is here, right? Uh, it's not that every phone call uh, that goes here is like transcribed personally by a person behind the desk. Um, but we understand the technology. Uh, when you get your cell phone bill at the end of the month, you see all the numbers are there, right? Uh, that's saved. You know, everything you click on now. And, but Facebook is saved. You know that Google is ransacking through your inbox, not with people. But with algorithms, they're categorizing you. They're cataloging you. Uh, they are basically creating permanent records of private lives. It's not one person. It's not one government. It's not one institution. It is a culture that has been created on the back of a new technology uh, to advantage the institution at the cost of the individual. Everyone knows that now. They haven't necessarily absorbed it. They haven't necessarily reacted to it. And a lot of people uh, have simply accepted it. Uh, and frankly, there's not a lot that the average person can do about it. So understanding and accepting it uh, is the, the default response. But at the same time, there are people around the world who have made changes. Uh, in 2013, when I came forward now, you know, it's almost 10 years ago, uh, a huge proportion of uh, just web traffic across the internet, even logging into Gmail uh, and Yahoo and, you know, Hotmail, the, the, the big mail of the day, these different uh, web mail providers uh, were unencrypted. And your local network, you know, the guy at the coffee shop um, could push you to an unencrypted version of the page and then steal your uh, password and login details. So could your government. Those days are gone. Uh, now we've got certificate pinning in the browser. You can't force uh, certain pages to unencrypted connections. They'll just fail. Uh, and that means the network that everybody's communications are transiting over, right? Uh, we're no longer electronically naked. We have little clothes on us as we go down the path. They can still see us moving. They know your computer is connecting to this site at this time. Uh, they know your phone with your identifiers is connected to this cellular tower at this time. And then you get in the car and it's connected to that one and that one and that one and that one. And you get them all, you're there. Bluetooth sensors in the store go, you know, you're in this store in front of this rack for this amount of time. Uh, and it is getting worse, right? Uh, but before it was a very uneven playing field. Academics understood it. Uh, experts understood it. That this was technically possible. And there was a lot of suspicion. There was a lot of smoke. There were good grounds for understanding that it was occurring. But the suspicion that something is happening and the fact that something is happening are two very different things, right? Uh, and this is all that matters in a democracy, because if we can't agree on what is happening, how can we respond to it? Well, now we know. Uh, the fact is there. And people uh, who do have the ability to influence it are changing things. I mean, all of you in this room, what were you doing 10 years ago? Uh, some of you were doing the same thing, uh, but now you approach the problems in a different way because you understand the network is hostile. We structure our protocols differently. Um, that's enough that doesn't answer things right. Uh, but the thing that gives me hope is this idea that we have made it through worse. We're heading back into one of these dark periods of history, right? 
Uh, and there are a lot of people who are not going to not going to be a lot of help. Um, we don't necessarily need to judge them, right? We don't know what their lives are like. We don't know what they're on the hook for. They've got responsibilities. They got jobs. They got family. They're just trying to make it home at the end of the day. Watch their TV show before they go to bed and get up in the morning and do the same thing all over again. Uh, but we depend on those people too. You know, everybody. And not everybody, but most people are providing some service. They're making some kind of contribution. Uh, and this human network uh, is the whole point of our digital network. The network doesn't exist for itself. The network ex exists to serve people. Um, there are institutions that are trying to make us serve them. Uh, they're trying to make the people serve the network. Um, and it's our job to fight that. But when I look at all the problems, when I look at all of these threats, when I look at everything, uh, bad thing that we're facing, bad decisions in governments here, there, everywhere, people don't give up. And frankly, you don't need a lot of people on your side to win uh, if you're using technology. Uh, and Bitcoin is an example of that. Right? Uh, one person or a few people uh, created something that now so many years later is still rolling and it's only getting stronger. Um, everybody is, you know, running to the dollar right now. All the other currencies are collapsing. Uh, but once everybody is in the dollar, right, uh, what happens then? Well, the dollar isn't safe either. And when people realize that, the question is, where do those dollars go? Uh, it's not really about money, right? Uh, but it's the idea that people are voting uh, with those dollars as a sort of sign of faith. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to be Bitcoin. I don't know if it's going to be something else. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm not super interested in, you know, the charts here. Uh, but the idea is we are at a moment in history where everything is in flux. Uh, but the cards are about to fall on the table. Uh, we need to be ready. We need to do the best we can uh, to respond to events as they occur and try to make a, the world a little bit better. There's a lot of things we can't fix. We're not going to be able to fix. There's a lot of people who aren't going to care. There are a lot of people who are going to try to stop us. There are a lot of people who are going to cause problems. And, you know, you can go out on the street right now and light yourself on fire. Uh, and most of the world is going to yawn. But sometimes one person is all it takes. And that could be you. And that's what gives me hope. Thank you for that answer. Great answer. Thank you for your time.